my slides? Yes. Great. Well, um, thanks everyone uh, for, for being here. Thanks to the organisers for putting this on and for inviting me to speak. Um, and well done everybody who's had to get up really early to, <laughs> to, to join in the fun. Uh, and I, I'm thinking of you, Chris Fuchs. I think I saw you there somewhere. So well done for, for getting up. Um, a tale of two cubisms. I want to talk today about a, a particular approach to quantum theory. I suspect that everybody here already has some familiarity with, with what cubism is. Um, what I want to explore today is the contested question of um, whether or how much realist it is. Um, so I'm going to spend quite a lot of time talking about different senses of realism. Um, and I'm going to oppose two uh, forms of, of cubism. Um, one is what I call, um, I tend nowadays to call full-blooded cubism, and that's what I take the current kind of view that Chris uh, and Rudiger Schack have, maybe David Merman too, um, noting that um, various different proponents of these views can differ in exactly what um, philosophical viewpoints they'd sign up to. The full-blooded cubism, as I say, which is what I take their preferred view to be, and something else which I call cubism light, um, which is uh, a view that doesn't go so far, but I think, and I'm going to try and persuade you, gives you all the advantages that um, full-blooded cubism does, or that one ought to want from the cubist approach, um, without um, gathering certain problematic aspects, which I'm uh, going to indicate for full-blooded cubism. And I should explain at the beginning that I'm not particularly um, seeking to provide arguments for cubism of, of either kind. Um, I'm just, my business rather is to uh, dispose of various bad arguments against cubism of either kind. Um, so think of this talk um, not as promoting a particular view, but as seeking to contribute to our understanding of what would be involved in holding a view and what the best and most defensible version of a view might be. Towards the end of the talk, I'll um, perhaps come back to lay my cards a bit more on the table. Um, okay, that's enough by way of introduction. So um, we're going to need to have in mind various different senses of realism. And as I say, it's a, a contested question to what extent cubism is a realist position. Um, for some people, it's very obvious that it isn't. Um, for others, uh, notably Chris and colleagues, it's very obvious that it is, and they get, inf get infuriated by people insisting that it isn't. Um, partly what's going on here is just people talking past one another, so partly this is a terminological issue, and partly it's because not seeing that there are different kinds of notion of realism in play, which one might be drawing on in different kinds of ways. So we'll be talking about different ways in which things might be realist, different ways in which things might be scientific realist, um, and so on. So a starting point is a, a very common sense form of realism. It's a, our default, part of our default conceptual scheme, I would suggest, which is just what we might call external world realism. So this is the idea that there is an external world, a world beyond the mind, uh, and it exists and has at least many of its features mind independently. Uh, so there are mind independent truths about how the world is. We need to add some qualification uh, to deal with uh, truths about one's own mind, of course. So um, truths whose subject matter involve minds aren't in the same sense going to be mind independent. But the rough idea is that there's a mind independent notion of truth which captures the facts about how the world is. And again, our default conceptual scheme seems to involve the thought that the world, at least the manifest image of the world, the ordinary world that surrounds us, the macroscopic world, we might even call it the classical world, but maybe we won't. Um, we tend to think that the world is composed of relatively enduring uh, spatio-temporally locatable things, objects, which bear properties and relations, which can be subject to change over time, and which engage in causal interactions with one another. A fairly standard kind of view. Why would one even bother um, articulating it? Well, we can see what some kind of contrast might be. And we can begin to see the force of articulating this conception if we uh, contrast with idealist or phenomenalist views, which would say that you know, actually the, the, the stuff before one, the computer before you, the table that it's on, aren't concrete objects which have their existence independently from us, independently of the mind. Really, these are collections of some kind of mental entity, perhaps some um, mental entity which is only um, 
uh, instantiated in an individual creature or person. Um, so there's something substantive in the claim about external world realism. Um, as I say, I think it's part of our default conceptual scheme. Okay. Um, now here's a separate idea. One might very well be, and I would suggest one should be, um, a realist about the external world in that kind of sense I just articulated. But we could note that, um, you know, that's the conception of the world in our ordinary conceptual scheme before we started pushing hard and before we started doing science. So um, we can think of science, if you like, as being aggravated common sense or common sense on steroids. So it may be that uh, the, our habits of thought and the ways of thinking about things which are apt for, uh, for, for, our, for our ordinary lives, our understanding of the objects which surround us in our ordinary lives doesn't necessarily hold that we start really pushing that and extending our sphere into um, different realms of uh, unobservable kinds of things, things that are either unobservable because they're too small or too quick or too large. Um, so scientific realism now deals with the question of, well, what should we do when we go beyond um, the immediate uh, kinds of objects of our experience? And the scientific realist says, well, okay, fine, in science we construct various theories. The aim of these theories, by and large, not always, but by and large, is to give us a true description of what the world is like when we take these theories at face value. So if the theories seem to talk about um, little things moving around very fast uh, or in a fuzzy kind of fashion, then we should take those statements not as being some coded way of describing experiences at a higher level, but literally true as descriptions of small things whizzing around in the world. So theories aim to give us a literally true description of what the world is like, both in its directly observable features, that's just the external world realism that we had before, but also in its non-directly observable features. And moreover, we've got good reason to believe that uh, our successful theories, our empirically successful theories that make good predictions, that have uh, powerful explanations, we've got good reason to believe that those things, those theories are true, or at least approximately true. Sometimes we introduce the weasel world word, sorry, mature here. So we say, well, it's the empirical su success of our mature theories, which gives us good reason to believe that they are true. Um, and again, a reiteration of um, the, the mind independence of truth here. The, 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 this notion of truth is supposed to be one of, of mind independence. Finally, it's typical to add a, a kind of a convergentist thesis that when we consider the march of history and the development of our scientific theories across time, that there's enough continuity between these. Of course, there's sharp, lots of sharp discontinuity too, but there's a lot of continuity and there's enough continuity that we can discern a pattern of increasing approximate truth in our theories across time. As I say, that's the standard kind of scientific realist view. Uh, the convergence thesis might come in weaker or stronger forms. Uh, one could be a scientific realist without being committed to the strong view that there is a final theory, that there's a limit of this convergent point of increasing approximate truth. Um, what may seem more plausible is that um, we could carry on increasing in approximate truth uh, without ever reaching if you like the very final story. Okay, uh, and it's important to realize that although I've been here talking about science and scientific theories, there's lots of different bits of science and there's lots of different kinds of theories within even the same bits of um, science. Um, and so you can have a differentiated attitude. It may be that some, although one's working within a broadly scientific realist um, uh, framework, there may be specific reasons why particular theories aren't yet apt to be thought of in this kind of way. Maybe they're explicitly constructed not to be committal about um, how things are in the world. They're explicitly there just to be a phenomenological model or something like that. Or it could be just that they're too, um, too young to have been fully bedded in and to have acquired the kind of security, or the epistemic security that would warrant us in believing that, that what they were saying was approximately true. Okay, so this is familiar. Um, Owen yesterday talked about uh, very similar kinds of things in his talk. Now, our main interest here is quantum theory, of course. So how might a scientific realist uh, picture play out in quantum theory? The standard kind of way um, that it would do that is um, uh, something like the following. So we need a descriptive um, uh, account of the world. So we need to interpret the formalism some or some part of the quantum formalism as directly representing physical facts about the world. Now I don't mean here to um, disagree with um, anything that David Wallace said yesterday. I'm just slightly putting things in a different way. We might then want to interpret this as saying 
um, a scientific realist approach to quantum theory would give us a recipe for interpreting whichever, interpreting whichever of the particular quantum theories that we construct. Um, the, the recipe would tell us which bits of those specific quantum theories directly represent physical facts about the world. And we also often, when uh, applying scientific realist thinking to quantum theory, slip in an additional notion, um, which in particular was highlighted very effectively by Nancy Cartwright. And this is the idea um, which Cartwright calls fundamentalism, that at the bottom of things, there is some uh, uniform and uh, universal in scope set of generalizations, the laws of nature, which are the fundamental laws which um, determine how everything is at the bottom level, at the fundamental level, or at the most fundamental level, if there's a uh, deferred uh, increase of um, levels all the way down. Um, there's, but there's some um, set of laws which cover everything and higher level theories are reducible in toto to those um, more fundamental laws. Um, that's a powerful kind of um, conception of, uh, of science. Um, it seems that something like that has played a strong regulative ideal in our conception of what we're up to when we're doing science. And it's pretty natural when we're thinking about applying quantum theory because we think quantum theory is one of our most fundamental theories, or perhaps if we think that uh, whatever our most fundamental theory ends up being, it's going to be a quantum theory. It's natural for us to say that, well, when seeking to interpret the quantum formalism as representing physical facts about the world, we should aim to see the world as being described seamlessly and as a whole, all in one go. We're not treating different bits of it differently. So in particular, that would mean that if this kind of view is right, that reference to observers should play no role except in so far as we model these as physical systems within the theory. So you can think of this as being um, a physicalist assumption, um, the idea that facts about observers are going to be exhausted by, relevantly exhausted by facts about them, uh, their physical features. But it's a relatively unassuming physicalism. Um, the idea is that um, in this way of understanding the content of a theory, we don't need to make any special place for observers. Observers are only important to us because we are observers. Um, they're not important to the world or really to the fundamental formulation of the theory. That's a standard way of thinking about um, applying scientific realism to quantum theory. You'll already be able to see various different ways in which one might be able to reject some of these components without thereby rejecting some of the other aspects of realism that we talked about a moment before. Okay, there's a final thing, a final bit of realism I want to have on the table um, at this point. Um, uh, and that is something which is called metaphysical realism. I want to draw a contrast between this and both of the two previous things that I've said. So metaphysical realism, and this is a, a nice uh, framing of the, the view due to Bernard Williams. Metaphysical realism is the view that we can conceive of the world in some way quite independent of our own theories and the terms in which we describe it, and raise the question of whether our descriptions fit its real character, whether our descriptions correspond to the way it, the world, really is, the way it was before we got to it. <clears throat> he goes on, this version of realism is theoretically ambitious, but it's false or unintelligible. So that's a, a classic uh, Bernard Williams, uh, short, pithy, controversial, and probably right. Um, and, and this is why he goes on that, look, uh, this kind of view would suggest that we can, so to speak, get round behind our descriptions and see how they fit the world. And this makes no sense at all. Any conception of the world we can use at all is one that is already expressed in terms that we understand, our terms. The world cannot describe itself to us. So I wanted to point out that there is such a view, metaphysical realism, this particular label and Williams's discussion here is uh, coming from um, his engagement with Hilary Putnam's um, thought. Uh, there is this strong view, um, but we can hold either of the two or both of the two previous forms of realism, uh, external world realism or scientific realism without being committed to this further thing, metaphysical realism. Um, and indeed, Williams holds this view himself. Uh, he holds um, a strong, pretty strong realist view about the external world without being a metaphysical realist. So a bit more Williams this time from his um, 1978 book on uh, Descartes, which indicates how full-bloodedly, to use that phrase again, one could be realist without being a metaphysical realist. 
And here he's talking about um, uh, the differentiation that we often make between primary and secondary qualities. So primary qualities, or secondary qualities being um, sensible qualities like color, taste, um, smell, and so on, which there's a tradition going back to Democritus, which would say, well, these secondary qualities aren't really part of the world itself, or they aren't part of the fundamental story about the world. Uh, in some manner, uh, uh, they wouldn't be there if we weren't there. So they're something that we bring into the world or partly bring into the world. Whereas primary uh, qualities are supposed to be those features of the world which are there in some sense anyway. Um, so William says in developing a still robust realist view, with regard to the conception of the unobserved world, what reason have we to think that we can do better with the properties of the world as characterized by natural science? Can we really distinguish between some concepts or propositions which figure in the conception of the world without observers and others that do not? Are not all our concepts ours, including those of physics? Of course, there's no suggestion that we should try to describe the world without ourselves using any concepts or without using concepts that we human beings can understand. So that's the rejection of metaphysical realism again. The suggestion rather, is that there are possible descriptions of the world using concepts which are not peculiarly ours and not peculiarly relative to experience. Um, such a description would be, arrived, uh, would be that arrived at, as C.S. Peirce put it, if scientific inquiry continued long enough. So again, here, there's no uh, thought that there must be some fundamental story about how things are. It could be that we may never reach the end of scientific inquiry, but there could be um, uh, a prolonged process of getting closer to it. So a structural realist, to go back to some of the discussion from yesterday, uh, sentiments are consistent with this. Now, just a final little bit more Williams because it's going to be relevant to what we're doing later on. <clears throat> he says, the representation of the world that would be so arrived at when we take away our peculiar parochial um, conceptual conceptions, the representation of the world that would be so arrived at must, if it is to fill the role required by the traditional distinction between primary and secondary quantities, be more than some minimal picture which merely offers the most that a, very set, uh, that a set of very different observers could arrive at, like some cosmic United Nations resolution. Its power to be more than this would lie in its being explanatory and in the way in which it would be explanatory. The picture, that offered by natural science would explain the phenomena. It would explain them moreover, even as they present themselves in other more local representations. It is this consideration that gives the content to the idea that the scientific picture presents the reality of which the secondary qualities as perceived are appearances. So the bit I want you to hang on to for later is this um, idea about trying to offer more than uh, the cosmic United Nations resolution. Okay. So now let's turn to cubism. What reasons might one have for cubism? I'll tell you in a little bit more detail what cubism is in a moment, but just to get ourselves going. There are different ways in which one might seek to motivate the position. Uh, one very natural starting point is just turning on considerations of the nature of probability and arguing um, that all probabilities must ultimately be uh, thought to be subjective and personalist. But there's a different kind of way which we can come at, come at it, which emphasizes, if you like, the scientific realist credentials of the approach. So consider a fable about scientific progression. So we start, as we did a moment ago, with the thought that the world exists mind and agent independently, and that the aim of science is to find out about that world. So doing that, of course, we're going to require theories that predict and describe and explain things. And then we imagine that uh, and rightly so, it would seem that physics by and large has been successful, enormously successful in giving us theories which have this feature that can predict, describe and explain. But suppose that as we keep pushing, um, pushing nature further and further, controlling and exploiting it and probing it in greater detail, um, suppose that at some point we run into, into the buffers with this project of um, explanatory descriptive theory making. Suppose that no matter how hard we try, after a certain level, it's impossible to come up with an adequate um, characterization of the features of things. It's impossible to come up with some adequate microphysical laws which describe the goings on before us. That's worked uh, at a certain level and for many years, but at some point we reach um, uh, a collapse of that endeavor as we push further into the microscopic domain. 
And let's suppose that um, that isn't just because we're being too dumb or that we don't have adequate computational power or anything of that kind. Suppose it's the case because in fact, um, we've run out of facts, as it were. Suppose it's the case that the world just doesn't admit of any descriptive theorizing below a certain kind of level. Suppose, to use Bell's um, nice phrase here, that below a certain level, the world is unspeakable. There aren't sets of reliably statable uh, law-governed truths to be had. Move up a bit and you begin to find them again. As we move towards the macroscopic classical level, we find plenty of good order, reliable regularities, properties engaging in normal kinds of causal commerce. But below a certain level, we run out of, of, of facts to describe. And then the cubist thought is that uh, this isn't a fable, this is a fact. This is the situation that we find ourselves in. What we should draw, they would say, from the various no-go theorems of quantum mechanics is not that we should come up with a still more clever uh, uh, hidden variable theory or something of the kind, some further attempt to complete um, a microphysical law-governed description of things. Um, all those views, they think, are artificial and rather desperate attempts to cling on to an atavistic and now um, palpably um, unsuccessful mode of scientific theorizing. Uh, this is not fable, uh, but, but fact that we can't go further. So they reject um, the idea that um, there are further microscopic facts to be found. But they don't then fail to be realists. They're, if you like, just facing up to these absences. The traditional realist descriptive project has been stymied. We can't go any further in this direction. Um, does that mean we must stop entirely? Well, they would say no. We can adopt an indirect approach um, to understanding the world. We can't go further in the direction of detailed descriptive microphysical law providing. But we can ask questions like, what is it about the world which makes it the case that the theory of this kind, the theory with a probabilistic structure of quantum mechanics, is our fundamental theory? We can indirectly seek to discern features of the world which can't be directly described in virtue of the impression that they leave on the proper structure of our thinking about how pragmatically to engage with the world. Um, so we can see the Cubist project as being embedded within a broad scientific realist program which just recognizes that when the facts at the microphysical level run out, you should stop trying to create them, uh, build them into one's description, I mean. Okay, good. So that's one way of motivating seeing what the Cubist is about and seeing the, um, the, the, uh, the, the view as being strongly embedded in a broad scientific realist program. So what now in more detail is cubism? So I already mentioned the importance of um, personal uh, uh, probabilities and personalist probabilities, the idea that probabilities express and only express degrees of belief about what the results of measurement interactions will be. Um, so quantum states, of course, encode probabilities. For cubists, um, that's all they do. And moreover, those, are, those probabilities are agents' degrees of belief and nothing more. And these are purely subject, subjective judgments. They're not matters of fact. And it's central to the view that there aren't any matters of fact um, in the external world which constrain what the agent's degrees of belief ought to be. It's a purely internal subjective judgment. Um, and taking that view about quantum states, it's then natural and perhaps obligatory to take it about other aspects of the quantum formalism too. Um, to, to acquire a consistent kind of picture. So in, in the cubist uh, view, not only quantum states, but also quantum operations, so time evolutions, what um, time evolution a system is subject to is going to be subjective. And the POVM elements that we um, associate to the outcomes of measurement devices, the particular clicks uh, or pointers of uh, measurement devices, devices pointing in particular direction, what POVM we should associate to a measurement device isn't a fact about the measurement device, it's a fact about us. Uh, and it's not a should kind of fact, it's just that I do believe that this measurement device is performing a similar kind of measurement, uh, is performing a particular kind of measurement, has a particular POVM associated with it. This is very radical stuff, okay? Um, I, I don't wish to deny that for a second. Um, okay. So we have on this view a theory which involves systems which can have states. Um, the system will be some kind of real thing, doesn't have a microphysical description, 
the only way of getting a grip on it is via its quantum state, which expresses our own degrees of belief again. Um, and then we have boxes, which we can think of as being schematized measuring devices um, and, and operations. And the uh, theory is deployed by agents. But um, looking at what the ontology is, all this is um, taking place within a world in which there are, it's an external world realist view, a world of smaller and larger systems. These include agents. Um, and where the larger systems are composed of the smaller ones. Crucially, for any of this to make any sense, for it to work at all, um, we're saying that for the sake of argument, for the sake of exploring the position, that at the microscopic level, there aren't any laws. Uh, but at the macroscopic level, uh, the level at which we've historically done physics up until quantum times, uh, we are going to see only approximate um, laws and generalizations at best. Okay. Sorry, I... Um, can't see the chat at the moment. Uh, I'll look at it later. Okay. So that's th those I take to be the core commitments of cubism. And, and note again how radical a view it is. It's, um, it's highly non-trivial and it's highly committing to say that um, quantum probabilities across the board and all related elements in the quantum formalism represent subjective judgments and not matters of fact. Um, Full-blooded cubism goes further in articulating and fleshing out the, the worldview behind that. So we, we do have to have a worldview in which there are, there's some kind of spatiotemporal structure, just checking the time. Laurie, how much longer have I got? About 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Um, so we, we've got some kind of spatiotemporal structure in which there are systems which exist and which interact with one another. Some of these systems are um, quantum agents, sorry, some of these systems are agents, um, others of the systems are merely um, uh, quantum uh, objects. Um, that's a very denude, that, that is an external world realist view, but it's a very denuded one, there's not much in it. How much more can we add? The full-blooded cubist um, and here we may take as a, um, a particular example of um, canonical statement of this kind of view, the uh, 2014 American Journal of Physics paper of Chris uh, Rudiger and David. Um, we begin from the agent's perspective. So not only do we say that um, quantum states and so on uh, represent agents, individual degrees of belief about what the results of measurement interactions would be, we also say something further um, about what the content of the expectations is. So here's some quotes from, uh, from Fuchs, Merman and Schack. So they say, a measurement in cubism, in full-blooded cubism, is any action that an agent takes to elicit a set of possible experiences. The measurement outcome is the particular experience of that agent elicited in this way. Uh, a measurement does not reveal a pre-existing state of affairs. It is an action on the world by an agent that results in the creation of an outcome, a new experience for that agent. Um, so this again is a, we started with a strong view, the bare cubist view, and we seem to have an even stronger view now. Measurement outcomes don't seem to be freestanding uh, features of macroscopic um, devices in our environment. They are said to be particular experiences of the agent. Um, and they're not, uh, pre-existing states of affairs. And they, they go on, what's the scope? What, what do we apply quantum mechanics to and what do we leave uh, as, as freestanding, if you will, not being treated quantum mechanically? Well, the answer here is for the full-blooded cubist, very little. Alice can use quantum mechanics to model any physical system external to herself. Moreover, um, this is the really strong bit, cubism directs her to treat all such external systems on an even footing, even agents other than Alice. So everything apart from the agent applying the system is to be treated quantum mechanically. But then all that's been given by the cubist quantum mechanics about how we should think about the features of those things um, is in terms of the agent's expectation. And now suddenly, although I've been trying to build up the realist credentials of the cubist, suddenly it sounds as if this isn't really very realist, external world realist at all now, is it? Because if it sounds like nearly everything is inside Alice's mind. What's happened to realism? So I think the answer here <coughs> will depend on the detail of one's account of perceptual experience. 
So if we have what may be a natural um, conception of the nature of experience, if we think that the having of an experience is the occurrence of a private intrinsic mental event, which need not be tied to the obtaining of particular perceptible features of the external world, then yes, I think the world has pretty much disappeared into Alice's mind. And then there's Bob, uh, and he's got um, a, a set of ideas in his mind, and Charlie with a set of ideas in their mind too. But we don't have anything like um, the picture held out by Williams of the external world um, with significant um, shared structure between different um, people deploying concepts in its description. Um, so is that curtains for full-blooded realism? It's collapsed into some kind of fancy um, uh, multiple idealism? Well, no. Uh, there are other conceptions of experience. So, you know, the, the view that I said is problematic is something like a, a classic empiricist sense datum theory or a Lockean indirect realist theory where the direct object of one's perception is uh, an idea in the mind uh, where at best one hopes that that idea has been causally produced in you by something external and indeed it resembles it. Um, I think that kind of conception of experience is going to be hopeless for the, for the cubists, for the full-blooded cubists, they're going to collapse into some unfortunate form of idealism. Um, but you know, thankfully that's a bad conception of the nature of experience anyway in my view. Much more promising are direct theories of perception and there'll be other ways of thinking about perception too perhaps in the phenomenological tradition and Michel Bitbol may tell us more about that tomorrow. But direct theories of perception say no no the um, uh, what I have direct contact with when I'm perceiving something is typically uh, when things are going well, an object in the external world. So objects in the external world and some of their perceptible features are constitutive parts of one's experience. So it's not that Alice is stuck in her head with this veil of ideas um, uh, pasted in her mind, which she then can't get beyond to be in touch with an external world. Rather, um, perception experience, perceptual experience is a matter of being in contact with the external world. And so we can see how it isn't, um, we're not just trapped in Alice's head now. Unfortunately, at least in that American Journal of Physics piece, it does rather sound as if what Chris and friends are describing is that sort of sense data -y Lockean theory of perception, they say. In cubism, the only phenomenon accessible to Alice that she does not model with quantum mechanics is her own direct internal awareness of her own private experience. To me, that really sounds like this kind of sense data Lockean idea uh, and so it's a bad way of doing things. Um, they say the personal internal awareness of agents other than Alice of their own private experience is by its very nature inaccessible to Alice and therefore not something she can apply quantum mechanics to. Fine, okay, maybe that was some uh, uh, just a particular feature of, of that paper on that occasion. Um, perhaps Chris and others would not particularly want to sign up to um, a detailed view about the nature of experience of that kind. I know Chris has had um, uh, thought quite hard about um, William James's neutral modest kind of views and so on as alternative accounts of uh, our place, of the place of experience in nature. So we can perhaps just chalk that up to a bad bit of, of drafting and, and move on, noting that there do seem to be conceptions of experience which would allow there to be multiple agents um, engaged in uh, a project of um, uh, realist description in an external world. But more generally, in any case, whatever one's view about um, the details of the nature of perceptual experience, full-blooded cubism really sticks its neck a long, long way out. Not only does it stick its neck a long way out to begin with by taking this very radical view about the, the standard uh, structure of quantum theory, but it goes much further um, in terms of the ontology that's being provided. And it's committed to a program of rebuilding the manifest image of the external world from which we started from extremely thin resources of egocentric experiences. As David Wallace mentioned yesterday, this kind of project in the past has not been a great success. Uh, and indeed, um, hasn't the, the, the attempts in this kind of direction have never even seemed to really get started from being ideas of projects rather than actual projects themselves. And to my mind, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise because to me it's all too plausible um, that the, the way we have to think about the actual contents of our perceptual experience um, is in such a way that presupposes the existence of the mind independent, uh, independent external world which already has many of the features that we take it to do. 
Uh, so it's no accident that trying to construct the world out of um, experience runs into problems because rather it's the other way around that experience is built out of the world metaphorically rather than the world from experience. But then the main point I want to make up, and this is, I guess, uh, will be my closing kind of comments, um, is that we just don't need to, to stick our necks so far out as this uh, in order to get the benefits of cubism. By all means, go for cubism. That itself is a radical view. But um, we can gain the benefits of that view without having to commit ourselves to this uh, extremely demanding um, kind of reconstruction project of the manifest image. And so this is where we come to cubism light. Um, and this is, uh, this, this is my name now for the, the kind of articulation of cubism that I gave in my 2013 book, uh, where at that point it wasn't clear to me that there was this full-blooded light distinction to be drawn. Okay, um, the main feature for these purposes of, of the light version of cubism as, a pair, as opposed to the full-blooded is to allow that the contents of the agent's expectations can go beyond um, uh, their own experiences, that they can talk directly about features of the macroscopic world surrounding them. And so we can grant in cubism light that there's a full set of ordinary facts at the macroscopic level. The world outside us really is pretty much as we take it to be and their mind independent facts about where tables are, where measuring apparatuses are, whether they've clicked, where their pointers are, and so on. Um, and we allow, as I said, that our cubist agents can have their expectations involving determinate features of the external world. For example, whether or not a measuring device has clicked, whether or not Vigna's friend's um, measuring device has registered a result or not. But do be careful here, there's, there's an important determinate and agent independent fact whether a measurement device registers an outcome or not, um, whether the measuring device has clicked or not. It will not be an agent independent fact what that outcome actually was. Why not? Because um, it's subjective what POVM element gets assigned to a given measurement outcome. That's part of the standard cubist story. Um, so, so yes, there'll be facts of things in the external world are, um, but how they should be understood quantum mechanically, if you will, their quantum mechanical meaning, their POVM element associated with them isn't a fact about the world, it's a fact that's brought to the world by the agent. In this kind of way of thinking about things, there's a lot to be realist about. Clearly, we don't have at the bottom of things a microphysical reduction base. That was just a starting point for cubism. We have the absence of descriptive laws below a certain level. But we have a richly structured world surrounding us. Um, so we're not committed to that rather daunting, perhaps impossible um, construction project of the manifest world from experience. Um, and in my view, I think we keep the main benefits of cubism. We get the resolution, the dissolution of the measurement pro problem. You know, the, the Vigna's friend case rem remains friendly. Exactly how the measurement problem arises, um, as again mentioned yesterday, differs from kind of case to case. And the Vigna's friend example is, is the trickiest one for, for, the, for the cubist framing. What should we say about the status of friend inside the laboratory? Should we take them to have a determinate fact about their experience? Should we take them to have a determinant? Should there be, we take there to be a determinant fact about what their measurement device was doing? Um, how does their view relate to the view of Vigna? Um, the cubist approach is helpful here because it says, well, different agents can assign different quantum states without disagreeing. Why? Because quantum states are subjective and pinned to agents, not features of the external world. So we can main maintain that even in the uh, in the cubist light version. Um, and in particular, it's important to note that on this view that Wigner's believing that there is a determinate fact about what his friend sees or whether his friend's device has clicked remains consistent with assigning the pure entangled quantum state uh, by Wigner, Wigner to, um, to, to friend, to device, and to whatever the starting trigger quantum system was. Um, and similarly, and I think this may be one of the may have been one of the main features that pushed Chris and friends um, towards the full-blooded version of cubism as opposed to the, the cubism light version. Um, worries about non-locality. You know, if it's the case that we have beables sitting around the place, you know, if, we, if we've got Alice's lab and we've got Bob's lab, and there are determinate facts about uh, whether there are clicks in Alice's lab and determinate facts about whether there are clicks in Bob's lab, then it looks like one's beginning to set up quite a lot of a structure that's going to give you um, a Bell kind of analysis and make us think that, oh dear, when we see um, Bell correlations, we're going to have to infer the presence of action at a distance. 
And so the full-blooded cubist gets away from that by saying, well, actually, you know, there aren't, for Alice, facts about goings-on in Bob's lab until they enter Alice's experience, which is going to be um, uh, at some point on Alice's timeline. So we can't understand things as involving action at a distance. So the full-blooded um, approach is very radical, um, but it avoids the problems of non-locality. I don't think we need to go that far to avoid the problems with non-locality. For, for the EPR case, just looking at collapse of the wave function and, uh, and entangled states, you know, it's, it's obvious that the cubist light problem, um, that the wave function collapse doesn't give rise to action to distance because wave function collapse is not a physical process, it's a process of updating one's subjective degrees of belief. And similarly in the Bell case, um, the cubist uh, and the cubist light, is, the cubist light will say, well, there are facts about um, uh, the patterning of beables in Alice and Bob's lab, um, but I'm not going to agree that um, the factorizability condition of Bell or Bell's uh, local causality condition stated in terms of probability expresses anything about causal claims, largely and in particular not about causal claims of action at a distance or um, of, no, of, of locality of not action at a distance. Why? Largely because I'm not in the business of offering any underpinning microphysical theory which would allow explanation of correlations of this kind. So no non-locality, I maintain, in the Bell case for cubism light, but certainly a backstepping, a backpedaling from what um, kind of explanation can be offered. That point's important. Okay, to conclude now, um, the senses in which I've been trying to argue that cubism is and isn't realist, um, and we'll see how much I've annoyed Chris in, uh, in this talk so far. Um, okay, so I want to maintain that the cubist has an overall commitment to the scientific realist vision, that was the fable. Um, it's just that they have a realistic, ho-ho, um, uh, approach to uh, the recalcitrance of the world. If the world is not playing ball, if there really aren't the facts there, then it's hopeless to try and construct a microphysical theory for them. You should just learn to put up with the idea that at a certain point, our descriptive endeavors fail. You can't go any further. That's the cubist vision. But it's embedded within a broad scientific realist conception of science overall. So it's not a blanket instrumentalist, which, instrumentalism which says, no, the point of science only ever is to um, organize um, our experiences of the directly observable. Um, a cubist can be committed to an awful lot more about science than that. Um, the view is not metaphysically realist, it's not committed to this impossible idea of um, trying to peer behind our concepts to see how the world really is and checking that our concepts really map onto the, onto the world. That's a perfectly healthy thing, I don't think anybody should be a metaphysical realist. Um, now obviously it's not realist about the interpretation of the quantum formalism, e.g. of the quantum state, you know, it's not part of the game that um, the state operations and so on are taken to be representative of facts about the world. Um, but I mean, that can hardly be taken to be an objection to the cubist view. It's a definitional of what the view is, and it's hardly as if cubists haven't noticed that this is what their view is. So it's hardly as if um, saying this to them is going to count as an objection or a black mark against their position. And crucially, um, not being realist about interpretation of various bits of the quantum formalism is consistent with believing plenty of realist things about the world more generally. Full-blooded cubism, I've said, if and only if it avoids the experience trap I mentioned, offers the hope of meshing perspectives of the different agents in uh, meshing them together to recover a sufficiently structured public macroscopic world. But um, it faces this uphill struggle or ambitious constructed project to fill out the realist picture of the external world. I think that's a big ask. Um, whereas uh, I think the safer thing to be would be a cubist light where we maintain the benefits without requiring the project. We maintain a lot of ordinary realist talk and a lot of non-quantum scientific realist facts can be maintained. Oops. The elephant in the room though is the question of explanation. I adverted to that briefly, too briefly when talking about Bell uh, and non-locality and, and local causality. The question is this, does even cubism light, for all that I've said, um, it allows there to be plenty of realist stuff in the world and the world surrounding us. Does even cubism light have enough resources to underwrite the explanations we in fact have that use quantum theory? So this is a bit like David's uh, the sky is blue kind of case yesterday. If we look at actual 
cases of um, use of quantum theory in explanatory practice. Does denuding um, the quantum talk of descriptive um, uh, content render too many of those or all of those explanations empty? My concern, uh, as again I talk about in my book, is indeed uh, that we should be worried about that. Uh, it doesn't look like cubism light does have, even cubism light has enough resources to underwrite the explanations we in fact use. Is that the end of the game? Not necessarily. It could be that a heterodox account of explanation could be developed. I sometimes wonder if something like Nancy Cartwright's simulacrum account of explanation might be helpful here. Or it could even be that so far from being the dispensable and gratuitous addition which I've suggested, full-blooded cubism itself holds the answer. It could be that the completion of the full-blooded cubist project would amount to providing that heterodox account of explanation, which would underwrite um, uh, the content of the explanations we in fact have that use quantum theory. Thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Uh, it's now time for the questions. Uh, so we start with Aurelien. Just sorry, yeah, I switch off. Yeah. So uh, I have a question. Uh, thank you for, for the very interesting uh, discussion about cubism. Uh, I, I have a question about the, how much the, the, the interpretation rely on the um, Bayesian interpretation of probability. What happens if you use another interpretation of probability? Uh, because there is a, is a very interesting debate in the, in, the, in the philosophy of probability. Maybe if you use a frequencies or frequencies or, or typicality view, you will have a different uh, perspective on, the, on probability, and then you will not be able to, to make a, a theory uh, for interpreting quantum mechanics based on Bayesian uh, deductions. And so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think um, there are different things that one could mean by, by Bayesian. So, I mean, I take it nobody objects to Bayes' rule itself as an updating rule. Um, it is definitional of the Cubist project that they say, look, subjective Bayesian probabilities are what probabilities are. If you start introducing various of these other things, um, then um, it's just a very different story. It's not a Cubist story any longer. It's true that it's possible to preserve um, some of the non-realist features of, uh, well, not, not straightforwardly traditional realist features that one finds in the Cubist theory and adopt some other kind of approach to probability. But it's really, um, th this is very much a th uh, an approach to quantum mechanics, which is defined by its approach to probability. And that is the subjective personalist Bayesian one. Um, this is not to say that the other approaches aren't interesting. I happen to think that frequentism as an account of probability just doesn't work because you need probabilities for frequencies too. So it's not an exhaustive account of probability. Uh, I'm kind of dumb, I can't understand what the typicality talk amounts to, which isn't just talk of probability in, in some other kind of way. But cubism just has to be personal uh, subjective probabilities. That's the name of the game. Okay, okay. For my question. Thank you for the answer. Okay, good. The next question is from Eric. Uh, Chris, thanks. Thanks for that. I have um, I, um, a simple, I think a clarificatory question, which has a one sentence answer, I hope, and then a more substantive uh, question. The clarificatory question is um, when, when you were describing at the end of your uh, spiel on the realists um, about what, what they can do when they come up, uh, when they come across a part of the world that, that is unspeakable, you said that they are no longer able to, um, uh, to provide an account that is, um, the, uh, of the world as a descriptive account as uh, of the world as law abiding, but I wasn't sure whether the emphasis was on descriptive or law abiding. Whether they could still give an account that of the world as being law abiding, just not descriptively so, or whether they just can't do anything with the law abiding. I, I'm hedging my bets a bit, Eric. Um, I'm, I'm I'm inclined to think that the two are somewhat connected. At the very least, if we're to have terms with descriptive content. Um, uh, if we're to attribute properties to things, then we better have some sense of what it means to have that property and that typically involves some kind of sense of 
how that property would manifest under relevantly similar circumstances. And that may require something more like E or something in that direction. Um, so there needs to be some kind of some kind of regularity. It may fall short of um, exhaustive law-like regularity, but there needs to be some kind of regularity that goes along with our phrases having uh, attribution of properties having any content. That's my thought, but I'm I'm, I'm hedging a bit. Okay, thanks. The, 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 the substantive question is whether you think the cubist really has to be committed to um, the, kind, the kind of primacy of, of, of perceptual experience. Because um, I, 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 I really, um, the, there's a lovely remark by Popper where, where he says that the description of an experimental outcome is not an, auto, is not an autobiographical report. It is a statement, of, a, a conventional statement of socially accepted scientific fact. <laughs> yeah, I, I really love that. You know, the, the, the idea, I think, is that it doesn't really matter. There's no epistemic weight. There's no epistemic importance in my saying the instrument outcome, the instrument reading is three. What really matters is why I'm warranted in why, what, what it's reading three means and why I'm warranted in thinking that it's reading three actually tells me something about the world and more where that tells me what I think it's telling me about the world. And that really it, it involves what my understanding of the experiment is being involved in this huge kind of net network of evidence and that this is all about the, the there's a large part of, of theory and community built into that. And that that's really what's doing epistemically all the work in what in my understanding of experiments can the cubism take like i mean it, it, if the cubism isn't committed to perception based epistemology but they can take on what i think of as a much richer more realistic view of scientific epistemology can that solve some of their problems or are they just not, do they just not have the resources to do that? So um, that's a good question, Eric. Uh, so I think there are, uh, the, what I was worried was the Lockean style version of full-blooded cubism, I don't think could take that on. Um, I think it's possible that um, uh, richer accounts of the content of perceptual experience could involve that. Um, I mean, there are questions about the role of testimony here as well and to what extent testimony is reducible to experience or not but um but i think we uh, if we're to, to to give the full-blooded realist picture scope i think we ought to allow that there can be those ri richer kind of epistemic connections to draw on as well of course the devil is in the detail and, and seeing how it actually works out um but, uh, but but you're right that those uh, the, uh, I was going to say penumbra, but those surroundings of our experimental results are absolutely crucial to our understanding of their meaning and our uh, confidence in their evidential value. Thank you. Okay. Next question is from John. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, which was very clear. But I have several remarks, which are really objections. The first one is about experiments. Why do we do costly experiments if the only point of science is to predict their results? There's a real ethical problem there. You can speak about experiments leading to applications, but many costly experiments like the Higgs boson or uh, experiment at CERN have no application and we don't even claim that they have application. And if you we went to the government saying, look, we want billions of euros or dollars or something to do experiment just because it amuses us to predict the result of measurement, you really, which is what a cubist should say if he's honest, you really believe that they are going to give us the money? No, of course not. We go there, oh, we're going to learn the laws of nature. But privately we say, no, no, there are no laws of nature. We don't know any, uh, just macroscopic facts. Okay, that's number one. Number two, of course, people cry for explanation in, to, in terms of microscopic quantities. Could be, uh, the cell uh, theory in biology, it could be uh, genes, it could be microbes, it could be uh, viruses, and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, people go down the scale. I mean, the question is, where do you stop? The micro-macro distinction is not so clear. And of course, we cry for explanation. And I at least have a perfectly clear explanation of all the facts about, let's say, non-relativistic quantum mechanics with particles and so on, which is the brain bohm theory. That, accounts for everything, it's natural. I could go on and on about that, but I won't. I mean, so of course you could say, well, what? then people jump on you and say, what about relativity? What are, okay, let's wait and see. I mean, all the objections that we can't go further from the cubist already have an answer in that 
in that framework. Okay, maybe we can't go further. For example, I'm convinced that maybe we can't go further when we have strings. We don't have evidence for strings, we don't have experiments, and maybe that's beyond our comprehension or maybe beyond what we can do, you know, because of uh, difficulty of doing experiments on such scale. I'm perfectly happy with that, but I'm not happy with giving up non-relativistic quantum mechanics. There I have a theory. And then finally about EPR Bell, you see, the fact about EPR Bell is this. There are perfect correlations in the world which are purely macroscopic, okay? There are pointers perfectly correlated at a distance. When you do such experiments, you know very well what I'm talking about, okay? Now you are asking what's the explanation for that? And then what Bell shows is that using other perfectly macroscopic correlation with different angles, etc., such a local explanation cannot be found. That's a remarkable fact about the world. Ignoring it by saying, oh, but it's only when they meet that they know each about each other and so on, seems to be missing the point. The point which is revolutionary is that there are indeed perfect correlation in the world. You see, for example, I speak and you nod your head. These are correlated facts, but they are perfectly explainable even, <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> you may not agree or disagree. That that's not the point. You may smile or something, but you see, these are perf correlated facts in the world which are perfectly understandable even using some human psychology. But you, you see, but there you have facts about the world which are unexplainable in local terms. And that's a remarkable fact. And the fact is they're be using only macroscopic facts, not, of course, it's inspired by quantum mechanics, but you don't need to invoke quantum mechanics. You don't have to speak about collapse of the wave function or anything like that. Just these facts are, these, you know, uh, these data are unexplainable locally. That's the whole point. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, those are fantastic questions and ex extremely uh, powerfully put. Um, so on the on the funding the Higgs question, I, I mean, does it really help to say uh, yes we want the money because we want to understand the fundamental laws of the universe? I mean that that sounds good. Maybe it sounds theological. That's what people say. But That's right. But, but why do we want to understand the laws of the universe? Because it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we're all motivated by. It's intellectual. Why is it interesting to predict results of measurement? But do we gain understanding uh, by being able to give ourselves the power to predict the results of experiments? Now, no, I, I understand the, the general point, and there is a general um, point here about um, uh, the relationship between understanding experience and prediction. Um, but uh, I think ultimately this is going to coil back. To, so I, I'm not saying that cubism is unproblematic, right? I'm not saying it's not radical, but I am saying we should locate the problems in the places where the problems are. I think the problems are to do with the nature of explanation. So I actually agree with you. I think explanation is absolutely central if one can't underwrite the huge variety of interesting explanations we have, then a view should be dropped. Um, I just think it's slightly too early to say that the cubists can't do this. Um, I've sketched at the end a couple of hopes for ways in which it might be done, but this is, I think, the, the big question. Um, on the micro-macro level and, and where, the, um, where the, uh, uh, the point of giving up is, so I, I agree with you that um, the micro-macro distinction is, uh, is loose um, my, uh, and imprecise. My sense is that, well, the, the full-blooded cubist gets around this really by um, treating everything as quantum. I mean, this is apart from Alice, this is part of the point of that move um, is to give a uniform treatment of things um, apart from uh, that which we're singularly interested in the distinctiveness of namely our own uh, selves. So, um, so the full-blooded cubist is here in better, in some ways in better um, shape than my cubist light who puts much more weight on uh, the macro micro distinction because they allow that um, there are determinate facts at one level and not determinate facts at the other. Um, and it will be a consequence of this view given that the micro macro distinction is mushy and vague that it will be at some points mushy and vague uh, whether there are determinate facts about things. Um, as to the question at what point is it reasonable to, if you like, give up the realist descriptive urge? You said maybe at the level of strings, um, Chris, Rudiger and, and David are saying, you know, at the level of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, this is, uh, I'm gonna just bracket that as a question of aesthetics and taste. Um, I think we should keep a number, personally, I think we should keep a number of uh, options available on the table and we should play around with things to see what 
uh, is helpful. We should seek to um, gain understanding of all the options that we have available to ourselves. EPR and Bell, perfect macro correlations. You, you put it brilliantly at the end. Um, we can't deny that there are macro correlations. Certainly the, the cubist light who allows that there are macro things, there are beables in the labs, the, the, the full-blooded realist, um, the full-blooded cubist wouldn't say this, but my cubist light um, does say that there are um, uh, macroscopic measurement outcomes which are correlated and there's no explanation for that. Uh, there's no local explanation for that because there's no explanation for that. Um, that's of a piece with their rejection of expl explanatory demands overall. So I don't see that there's a problem with um, non-locality in cubism light or indeed in full-blooded cubism. I do think there's a general problem with explanation and we can see the question of locality as just being a special case um, of the general problem about explanation. So uh, I agree with the thrust and the importance of all of your questions. Um, and I hope I've said a little bit about how the cubists would think in response to them. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is that yeah. our disagreement? Oh, no, no, at least it clarifies our disagreements. Okay. Um, there are more questions. Uh, of course, at this point, if Christopher Fuchs wants to comment on anything, you can feel free to intervene at any point. Um, otherwise, uh, the next question is from Guido. Hi, Chris. Uh, you've uh, you've heard me say this before, so you can be you can be brief about this. Um, but um, I, I was wondering what. Uh, yeah, you you think about this? Uh, um, uh, the sort of slippery slope towards this sort of full full blooded cubism, I think, comes uh, by uh, not distinguishing you know, between the quantum state as a catalog of probabilities and a quantum state as uh, uh, yeah, a non probabilistic object. And uh, uh, yeah, to, to make clear what I mean, uh, yeah, just think of the history. 1926, when Born introduced the statistical interpretation of the quantum state, quantum states, at least stationary states, had been around for 13 years already. And uh, um, uh, 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 Pauli had uh, uh, had calculated the, the hydrogen had predicted calculated reproduced the hydrogen spectrum uh, you know, from matrix mechanics uh, you know before Born had introduced the the Born rule so you know, there's, there's a lot of quantum mechanics that's there already that has nothing to do with probabilities. Uh, uh, you know, I love the way that cubism you know, thinks of probabilities as as subjective in quantum mechanics. Uh, you know, I'm very fond of that idea, and uh, you know, it was uh, uh, you know, it it was Chris uh, Chris Fuchs, you know, who uh, you know made me made me fall in love with that idea. So I I, I love that aspect of cubism, but uh, um yeah, uh, you know, I think. There are two aspects of the quantum state uh, you know, that uh, uh, yeah, have always been different, really, you know, but uh, you know, uh, you know, have you know, run the risk of being uh, uh, yeah, run together. And uh, um, yeah, maybe if you'd like to comment where you stand on that. Um, I don't know where, 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 yeah, where, where do I stand? Where do I think Chris might stand? Perhaps he'll, he'll say in a minute. Um, I mean, I'd be inclined to say that these aren't two concepts of the quantum state. The, the, on the one hand, there's the concept of the quantum state, on the other, there's the Hamiltonian. Uh, right. So, really, what what's been going on is in the in the previous structures that you're talking about is you're saying, look, what, what what's the what are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian? That's a question about the structure of the Hamiltonian. Now, you can only actually get the Hamiltonian to do much work for you once you couple it with claims about what the state, the quantum state, in its ordinary probabilistic, well, in its ordinary sense for the cubist, the probabilistic sense is. So it's not really that you can get um, uh, anything for free just from the Hamiltonian. There are probabilistic assumptions going in the background there. So um, uh, in, in terms of a slippery slope, um, I, I see it more as a, as a demand for um, 
coherent articulation of a of a viewpoint which makes sense internally in in its own kind of way. Once the quantum state is um, subjectively Bayesian, um, having a non uh, having an objective Hamiltonian is not going to really do anything for you. Does that sound about right, uh, other Chris? I'm not sure I want to be drawn into this. <laughs> Fair enough. What, 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 what was it that you just said, Chris? Um, well, I was uh, urging that what Guido was drawing attention to was not two notions of quantum state, but rather that of the Hamiltonian and the state, and that um, you couldn't really get any content out of claims about the Hamiltonian without also having some claim about the, the quantum state, which would be the probabilistic aspect. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, from my point of view, it's all about how the things fit together, and um, the fitting together, one might say, has a more objective claim than the individual terms in the fitting together. But I, I shouldn't be in this conversation, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bow out. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. I, I I still disagree. I think uh, you know, uh, no. atomic spectra. Uh, uh, are, are one thing, and the the intensities of atomic spectra you know, are you know, uh, a further aspect. Uh, and you know, historically, you know, these were these were different. So you know, there was uh, you know, the problem of frequencies, the problem of intensities, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, yeah, I think yeah, these are these are different aspects belonging to belonging to quantum mechanics. Uh, and uh, you know, by the time uh, you know, Bornhuis and Bergen Jordan had uh, had had finished, uh, you know, with what they were doing, you know, we had uh, you know, quantum mechanics as a non-statistical theory, and then Born came along with well, in a bit of a hand-waving way, and then von Neumann came in in a sort of rigorous way, building a statistical theory on top of the Sort of non-statistical, you know, algebraic structure of quantum observables and so on, um, and uh, um, you know, if you want to talk about you know values of observables, or if you want to talk about eigenstates, uh, uh, yeah, you can translate between uh, between those two languages. Uh, 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 but uh, you know, there's a sense in which quantum states uh, or, or translated, you know, values of of observables. Uh, uh, you know, are distinct from uh, the probabilities uh, 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 that uh, you know, we use states uh, to uh, to determine. Um, but I'll 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 rest my case. Okay, good. Um, there are other questions. Unfortunately, you are running out of time. So now is the time for a short ten-minute breaks. Uh, of course, for people who wants to continue discussing here. Uh, they can feel free to do it. Otherwise, for the others, we will reconvene at uh, 11.40. There were two more questions. So if they're not going to coffee, I'd love to hear the questions. There was Klaus Molmer and there was someone else. I can ask my question first. Uh, good morning, Chris. Uh, hey, thank you very much for, for a very nice presentation. I, I have one question, and, and uh, Ms. Bohr talks about the experimental apparatus, and of course, a classical world as, as real. And, and I was wondering if you would characterize the Copenhagen interpretation as a special variant of the cubism light. Uh, and, and if that's the case, would there be a merit in, in distinguishing different versions of cubism light uh, and, and characterizing their different uh, potential? The, the, which interpretation did you mention? I didn't quite hear. Oh, the Nils Bohr view, the Copenhagen interpretation oh, yeah. at, at large. Yeah. yeah, good Good question. I mean, um, I'm, not, I'm not a Bohr expert uh, by any means. There, there clearly are some similarities between Bohrian thinking and uh, Cubist thinking, but also some important differences. Um, I wouldn't have thought that Bohr would like the... Um, uh, subjectivism about um, the quantum state uh, operations and, and so on and so forth. And he's much more um, uh, determinate about um, the role of the classical world than 
um, than cubists are, and certainly than full-blooded cubists are. That's but, exactly my question. Sorry that, yeah. that when you define your cubism like you are making the things you take for for granted for real, so to speak. And in some sense, you might say that Bohr takes the the classical world for real. He takes the apparatus for real. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, that's right. Um, I mean, one thing that even the, the, the cubist light wouldn't be inclined to do necessarily is to say, like Bohr did, that um, the terms of classical physics are essential to the interpretation of, uh, of quantum theory. So there's, we might want to draw a distinction between uh, claims about the language of classical physics and facts about um, uh, macroscopic kinds of objects. Um, but uh, what other salient differences are there? Um, th there are certainly these, these kinds of similarities, but disagreement about the nature of probability is probably the most important one. There was someone named Veliko who had, um, uh, I'm sure I'm saying the name wrong. Oh, there he is. Yeah, it's, it's fine, it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm quite used to that. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Anyway, um, yeah. What worries me is 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 as as I understood uh, uh, folks who, uh, who's here and and his colleagues is that uh, like they're not really this full blooded cubist as as I get it, and they have some arguments to 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 claim why they're not full blooded cubists. And what they have in mind, as I know, is uh, first that this born rule is something uh, that anyone can pick up and use. Right? It's it's something. It's not something very personal. On the other hand, there is this um, um, intrinsic uh, in, um, way in which the world is in, indeterminate. So um, I guess that's something that also that works for everyone. So uh, in, in that way, I think they at least try to argue that not everything is in Alice's head and they try to save themselves from this uh, accusation. So. I'm just wondering, what do you think about these arguments, like uh, as a way of, of fleeing a bit away from from this full body cubism and more towards cubism light, but not really being cubist light either. <laughs> well, um, perhaps there are a, a further range of alternatives. I haven't thought especially hard about um, uh, a spectrum of views here. Um, I mean, given how um, hand-waving cubism light is about the, the gap between the level at which there are determinate facts and which there are not. You might say it's already intrinsically an elastic kind of a view that might stretch to include a very, a number of more precise ones. Um, but I, I mean, I think we're likely to get further by working a bit more with some kinds of concrete examples and it's slightly difficult to know how to do this. Um, given on the one hand, the, the complexities of analyzing real live quantum system. I mean, that's part of the fun of do, doing quantum mechanics, of course, is fiddling with the complexity of real live systems at various scales and complexities. Uh, but also with the um, trying to give an account of the, the nature of experience in general and of um, uh, evidential support for theories in general. All these are complicated kinds of things. Um, so, uh, so, in short, I don't know. I mean, the um, the full-blooded cubist does need something which isn't um, of the sense datum or Lockean kind of conception of the contents of experience. There are probably lots of things um, which aren't that. The question is um, going ahead and trying to articulate one in uh, a bit more detail. Yeah. Uh, all right. Thanks. I mean, I, I just kind of wasn't sure uh, whether, whether like folks, maybe maybe he can say a word on that, but uh, whether he would advocate his full blooded cubism or uh, who would ever who would ever try to advocate something so strong that let's completely look in or something. <laughs> but thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Michelle Bitball will give a talk tomorrow that um, will try to argue that the notion of experience that that we've been striving for, not not the sentence written by David Merman that Chris Timpson showed in his in his talk, but the notion that we've been striving for, Bitball will argue that it's more naturally placed in the phenomenological tradition.
And so either uh, Husserl in, in some flavors of Bitbull's presentation or Merleau-Ponty, I've always thought I felt into the, fell into the pragmatist tradition and not the Lockean one. So, um, but you know, some, sometimes we, we aren't the best in our formulations and that 2014 paper might've been one of those examples. I'm going to go to bed now. I got up very early for Renato and for Chris, and I've done my work for the day. Good, and you've thrown your co-author under the bus. <laughs> and I've thrown my co-author under the bus. <laughs> Bye-bye.